Welcome to this special HTV presentation of Houston, epicenter of the fight for disability rights. I'm Lex Frieden. I'm professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, and I direct the Southwest ADA Center at TIRR Memorial Hermann. I'll be your host for today's program. <laughs> 2015 marks the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. To celebrate this significant occasion, we have produced for you a program depicting the roles of Houston and Houstonians in the fight for disability rights. The video you are about to see includes news footage and amateur movies dating back to 1977. This montage of archival clips recounts the history of Houston's Coalition for Barrier-Free Living, one of the first disability advocacy groups in the nation led by people with disabilities representing many different types of disabilities. Now, please join me in watching Houston, epicenter of the fight for disability rights. It began with the Vietnam veterans, the wounded among them, who refused to disappear into hospitals and nursing homes. They felt that their country owed them normal lives. They spearheaded what was to become a new movement. The new militants are the disabled citizens of America, demonstrating as best they can. CBS reports with Marlene Sanders. How much for the handicap? Disabled people have suddenly become visible. No longer are so many shut away in institutions or in back rooms at home. They have been demanding their rights, as other groups have before them, and they have begun to get what they want. There is a complicated, far-reaching, and expensive new law now, extending into every area of life. It's called the Rehabilitation Act and it was passed in 1973. But now it was April 1977, and Section 504, a crucial segment of the law, still had not been funded or put into effect. Finally, on April 28, 1977, Section 504 regulations were signed. In human terms, what did the law accomplish? One of the things it did was to provide some money for projects like this one in Houston, called New Options for Independent Living. The research director is Lex Frieden, who became disabled. I was 18 years old, and I broke my neck in an automobile accident. I was paralyzed instantly. Lex finished college while living at home, but soon began to want a more independent way of life. Out of his need, and that of others like him, a number of institutes for independent living have come into being around the country during the last few years. Places where disabled people learn to cope with a society that was not designed for them at all. While in some respects it might be easier to be taken care of than rather than be responsible for your own life, uh, in most respects, I think handicapped people would prefer to have that responsibility and you know, the benefits of that justify the effort that's required to, uh, to put up with the day-to-day -day routine kind of hassles that, that we all have in our lives. Even an ordinary shopping trip presents obstacles for a person in a wheelchair. Transportation, planned in advance. Doors must be wide enough to get through, and someone has to open them. Thank you, thank you, good man. Thank you. There must be no steps leading to restaurants or movies or stores. As Lex Frieden puts it, there must also be regular contact with the outside world 
so that disabled people can function there and so the rest of us can learn how to deal with them. Thank you. Thank you it's difficult for able-bodied people to accept me as part of that society when uh, they're meeting upstairs somewhere, so to speak. I think the attitudinal problems uh, may be the, the biggest problems. Those problems can be solved very easily by uh, integration by mainstreaming handicapped people because I think that able-bodied people soon realize that they're not any different than disabled people and, and vice versa uh, if they're able to be together. I live for the day that whether to make it in my lifetime but it it'll come before too much longer I think in which the international symbol of access which is used now to indicate to me or to someone else with physical disabilities I want to see the day come in which there is no need for that sign. Because I'll know, as you know, that, that anywhere I go, that I have free and independent access into and use of, as you do. Free and independent access is what disabled people want. Not only to buildings, but to all of the normal challenges of life. But what can be expected from the larger society from us. In years past, we never faced the question at all. We have decided to confront it now. Uh, because there's steps on the bus and, uh, instead of a lift. Uh, well, I, I have no idea why they have a lift. Uh, there's, they give us many reasons. Uh, they do have some with lifts, though, but 80% uh, of them are inoperable. And uh, they're, they're operating on uh, fixed routes where there are uh, very few people that are in wheelchairs. Uh, they go by complexes where there are you know, people living uh, in wheelchairs, but uh, they feel to realize that many people do not live in those. Uh, the vast majority of yeah, The Coalition for Barrier Free Living was initiated about two and a half years ago, and our purpose was to um, work in Houston on eliminating architectural, attitudinal, and transportation barriers in the city of Houston. Uh, since that time, our main thrust, I would say, or one of our main thrusts, has been uh, working with office public transportation towards obtaining an accessible bus service in Houston. Our request here today is that the city really take a long and hard look at what they can do for the handicapped. Uh, in San Antonio, there's a door to door service in Austin. There's the same type of transportation service. In Minneapolis, the same thing exists. Also in Los Angeles, has ordered 200 totally accessible buses for the handicapped that are in the process of being manufactured right now. We feel that Barry Goodman and the Public Transportation Office have been, you know, just basically given us focus for uh, six buses were ordered in uh, 75. They were put in the downtown circulation system. An outside uh, consultant firm, Fishman and Kirk, from Philadelphia was brought in here. And $9,000 was wasted, I guess, because maybe you all know about $4,500 to train the drivers how to use the bus. And another $4,500 was used to determine that a route from the medical center to downtown should uh, be brought into the census with those minibuses, uh, which is totally absurd because the handicapped people don't live at either one of those complexes. The city has been on the In essence, what you're doing by denying transportation, not just denying transport. What you are is curtailing experience. What you're doing to the handicapped individual without transportation is isolated in their living situation. And that by denying them the means to get to school, recreation, restaurants, things like that, you're not just, in essence, denying them the mobility. You're denying them a whole lifestyle that everyone else in society does have. And if Houston had some kind of a system, you know, a small kind of minibus that would come around like a dial-a-ride sort of thing to pick people up and then transfer them to a larger, uh, broader system with, with lifts and so on, so we could get around and do 
didn't do work. You know, this is the whole the whole story. I just I, I would like to be able to say, look, you know, I, I uh, this this is what available. It's paid by public funds. It's supposed to be accessible to everyone. The Coalition for Barrier-Free Living has been active as a pressure group and is now attempting to get city housing codes changed so that more apartments will be available. The City of Houston Building Code has certain specifications that deal with the physically disabled and that overall it touches on some of the uh, federal and state standards, but it needs some upgrading, quite a bit of upgrading. It takes a little more money, supposedly, to build a build an apartment, say, uh, accessible for a wheelchair. But, you know, it's only 1%, I think, is a national figure. So I think we need to fight for uh, including apartments in the, whole, in the uh, new building code. The biggest hassle was in dealing with the apartment builders. That's going to be something that we're going to have to fight for years. They are adamant in their uh, refusal to make any changes as far as... Uh, bathroom modifications and things like that. It's going to cost a lot more in the long run to support us in nursing homes than it is to put a 1% out and make the, make the house accessible. <laughs> the options now for practically meal, there's no place for disabled people to go. And I think really where you live is the whole ball game. Where you live and where you work and we've got to start there. Handicapped groups have been demanding for years that Metro equip buses on major thoroughfares with lifts for wheelchairs. The Coalition for Barrier-Free Living filed a lawsuit against Metro and went to court today to argue their case. Uh, we believe that Metro has discriminated against people with disabilities by purchasing vehicles and, and, uh, that are not accessible to people with disabilities. The court hearing was postponed, but before the group could get out of the courthouse, Metro called the news conference to make a major announcement. Metro Board Chairman Bob Lanier is supporting a recommendation that will go to the full board later this month for the purchase of wheelchair lift equipment on all future bus purchases. I'm just absolutely, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, there are, were hundreds of people who worked on this. Metro admits it was a reversal in policy. But I think it does show a willingness for us to examine uh, various policies and decisions that we've made in the past and uh, make changes when necessary. Metro is ordering 300 new buses over a five-year period and is proposing to equip them all with wheelchair lifts at a cost of $57 million in federal money if approved by Metro's board. And if they vote in support of, of all lifts on buses, we'll, we'll drop a seat. There's no reason for it. This is what we wanted. The coalition is busy now getting the word out to the disabled community. That we won with Metro. Oh, yes, I just heard about it. That's right. That's Bob Nicholas, Channel 2 News. Riders will have some new wheels very soon after a big victory yesterday in a Metro board meeting. As expected, the Transit Authority board voted to equip all new buses with wheelchair lifts. Debbie Johnson has the story. Metro board members did an about face when they unanimously agreed to equip all new buses with wheelchair lifts. The federal courts ruled recently that municipalities are not required to provide such a service. But an act pending before Congress that will establish accessible transit to all riders has encouraged Metro to change directions. I think at the heart of this decision was a notion that uh, what, as I said in the board meeting, that what this country really is about is the ability of all citizens to participate equally. Uh, to uh, the, the government's role is to give each of our citizens uh, a, a chance to make that contribution uh, of which he or she is capable. It's a small thing, but uh, it's, it's uh, what help we can give to these people, and they're, they're, they're good folks, to, uh, to make, uh, make whatever contribution they're capable of, and I feel just as good as she does about it. She is Lori Gerking, Vice President of the Coalition for Barrier-Free Living. At Metro's board meeting, they announced they were dropping their lawsuit against Metro in light of the lifts being installed. We believe Metro's decision is an important step in the continuing effort to remove discrimination and create equal access for people with disabilities in all areas of life. Many people who have lacked access to adequate transportation will now have the opportunity to be more productive and less dependent on public support. 
this decision of the Metro Board and, and with Mr. Lanier's support is going to open vast new vistas for people with disabilities. Handicapped riders will meet with Metro officials Friday morning to begin working on plans to implement the new wheelchair-equipped buses. Metro officials say they expect to have them in service by the end of the year. Debbie Johnson, 13 Eyewitness News. Disabled Americans must become full partners in America's Opportunity Society. He was a compassionate conservative. Nobody knew what that meant. So they ran around trying to find a piece of legislation to show what he was a compassionate conservative about. And so they came up with the ADA. And that's how he actually endorsed it. Today we will be hearing about the progressive efforts of the Houston community in promoting greater access for all citizens and the relationship between these activities and the proposals set forth in this Americans with Disabilities Act. We had hoped to have Congressman Nikki Leland in attendance at this morning's hearing when it was first planned. He was a true champion of human rights who fought for opportunity, hope, dignity, and freedom for all people everywhere in the world. We mourn his loss as well as the loss of the other dedicated people who died in the ill-fated humanitarian mission to Ethiopia. I would like to conclude by thanking the citizens of Houston again for their kind hospitality. I would especially like to recognize the contribution and associate my remarks with the remarks of Congressman Bartlett already about Dr. Lex Frieden, the former executive director of the National Council on the Handicap, under whose direction that council issued the report entitled Toward Independence. And that report led to the comprehensive legislation embodied in the Americans with Disabilities Act. I also want to recognize the tremendous efforts of the disability community and all others who helped to organize this hearing. I would like to further acknowledge the presence of another great Texan who was associated with the effort to promote this bill. Probably he's the champion or the super volunteer in all America, Justin Dart. Justin Dart. As the chairman of the Task Force on the Rights and the Empowerment of Americans with Disabilities, Justin Dart conducted hearings using his own resources in all of the states on this piece of legislation. We want to congratulate Mr. Dart on his appointment by the president to, the president, to chair the President's Committee on Employment of People with Disabilities, a, a recent appointment. I believe that the city of Houston has recognized the significant value of the disabled community in this city and has taken some steps to see that disabled people in Houston have equal opportunities. Our belief that, that we need to provide opportunities for the disabled community in this city and we hope that the legislation that we're sure you will adopt this year will have as its focus uh, the need for opportunity and the recognition of the tremendous value to society that is provided by the disabled community. A large group of disabled Houstonians made the trip to Washington to take part in the historic signing ceremony, and Don Cobos reports. After years of planning, fighting, and debating, 43 million disabled Americans were given what they all along rightfully deserved, to be treated like everyone else. President George Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act, which eliminates a number of barriers for the disabled. And today's legislation brings us closer to that day when no Americans will ever again be deprived of their basic guarantee of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The new law prohibits discrimination in employment, public accommodations, transportation, and telecommunications, and it includes a variety of sanctions for violators. Dozens of Houstonians made the trip today to Washington. Laurie Gherkin was one. You know, it's costing $200 billion a year to isolate people and to keep people in institutions, and this legislation will enable us to get out of the community, to have jobs, to have access to transportation. But with all these positive factors that are built into this new law, there's a downside. All these measures that will make buildings, transportation, and businesses like these more accessible to the handicapped are going to cost more money. Despite the concerns, disabled Houstonians, and there are some 400,000 who live in the greater Houston area, join others across America proclaiming this law as the beginning of a new day. Don Cobos, 13, Eyewitness News. 
The spirit that has united all these people along the way, including the family and friends, the advocates and others, is what we celebrate today. And for me, it brings back the same emotional feeling that we had out there on the south lawn of the White House on that proud, proud day in July of 1990. As a matter of fact, it was the largest gathering on the south lawn of the White House in our country's history up to that point, larger even than the signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And it was a moving experience to be there. Uh, as together we declared that we will not accept, we will not excuse, and we will not tolerate discrimination in America. But here we are, four years after that historic event, and it's appropriate that we're gathered here in Houston to celebrate the visionary work of trailblazing individuals and companies. Because while the ADA has had an influence on the city of Houston, Houston has had a profound effect on the ADA. For decades, I've been proud of Houston's vision and commitment to the issue of rights for people with disabilities. Remember when spurred on by Eleanor Tinsley, Houston became one of the first cities in the nation uh, to include barrier-free access in its building code. Uh, through the years, local companies like Houston Power and Lighting, Southwestern Bell have followed their lead and taken the initiative uh, to enhance these efforts. And so when it comes to the ADA, Houstonians have real reason to have a, a strong sense of Texas pride. And of course, many other Texans have played leading roles in securing equal civil rights for the disabled, and no less list is complete without Justin Dart and, uh, and Lex Frieden, two that I mentioned before. And of course, uh, we even include a guy from Dallas, Steve Bartlett. Uh, these three don't need any introduction. Justin served as chairman of my president's uh, committee for the employment of people with disabilities. Lex, as you all know, brought his expertise in the independent living movement from Houston to DC uh, to head up the National Council on Disabilities. And as for Mayor Bartlett, a uh, good guy, uh, even though he is from Dallas. And I remember back in the fall of 89, when his House committee uh, came to Houston to hold the very first ADA hearing outside DC. More than 500 people came to testify in support of the legislation. I wish our fellow Tex Texan Steve was here today. I don't want to miss anybody, but I'd also like to single out a few local individuals, Rob Mossbacker Jr., uh, Dr. Larry Pollock, Dr. James Engel, and of course, I'll, I'll end where I began, our own Mayor Bob Lanier, uh, for their inspiring efforts. What I feel here today is a shared passion for justice for all of our neighbors, friends, brothers, sisters, and just plain Americans. And so I'm delighted to be here to congratulate all of you who fight with the passion uh, to transform the lives that you touch, the lives of meaning which you help create are your truest, finest, and most lasting tributes. Thank you so much for letting me be here today, and may God bless you all. Thank you. Each human being has an inalienable right and an inalienable responsibility to govern their own life, to participate in government of their society, and to be maximally productive in terms of quality of life for themselves and for all of their fellow humans. I'm glad you've enjoyed our video. I'm very pleased to have with us today, Lori Rett. She was Lori Gherkin when you saw her in the video. Maria Palacios, the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Coalition for Barrier-Free Living. 
and Art Jackson, the man who makes Metro work for people with disabilities in Houston. Thank you all for joining me here today on the panel. So I'd like to visit a little bit about your impressions of the film that we just saw. Lori, uh, you were one of the uh, early actors in the uh, drama that we observed. Uh, you had the uh, distinct privilege of filing suit against the city of Houston. Did that make you anxious? Filing that suit? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, I chaired the uh, task force that filed suit against the uh, city of Houston to encourage the city to uh, order um, new buses, their new buses with lifts. And uh, what, what do you? What was the compelling? What moved you to that point? I mean, were you just frustrated because you'd been with this group that had been asking so long? And yes. Finally... I mean, for 12 years, we've been trying to get the city to order buses that had lifts on them, and we found out. And this is when we were working on the passage of the ADA, and most of us, the people within the disability community thought that the ADA was going to be passed within a year or two. And the city was getting ready to order 326 buses. I can't believe I remember that number, but I do. Um, 326 buses that were gonna be on the road for at least 20 years in the city of Houston. So that would have meant that 20 years there would have been buses that were inaccessible. And then after that, those buses would have gone to rural communities. And so for 20 more years, those buses would have been in I didn't realize that you were thinking ahead so far as to consider what happens to our disposed vehicles after they're yeah. Oh, yeah, that off was the a, streets. That was a big decision. Mm -hmm. So when the uh, uh, Metro announced the uh, change, were you surprised by that or did you think it would be settled? I mean. I thought we were going to court and I found out the day before the lawyer that represented us called me at home that evening and said, they've settled, they've agreed. And made it was, you happy. I was very happy, very, very, very happy. And there were a lot of us that worked now, on Maria, that. Maria, you, you actually joined the movement in the midst of all this action. I did, and I was so young. It's hard to believe, you know, that, that so much time has gone by. What, what was your early remembrances of the disability community in Houston and advocacy in particular? Well, the very first and most important memory was me coming to HCIL, CBFL, as you know. Um, the Coalition for Barrier Free Living uh, pretty much gave birth to Houston's uh, independent living as we know it uh, through the Centers for Independent Living, being that HCIL became the very first CIL in the state of Texas. So when I came in to the disability rights movement, being so young and being an immigrant, shy girl, as you kind of remember, which is hard to believe now. Hard to believe, right. yes. Exactly, it's so hard to believe. Uh, but to me, the power of, of us coming together, that, that our advocacy abilities to create change within our own community, the realization that we deserve more. Now, Maria, coming from uh, your status as an immigrant and also from a minority community. Right. One that doesn't necessarily promote, as we know, a lot of self-advocacy and outspoken behavior like this. Was this kind of a cultural shift you absolutely. had to make? Absolutely. Oh my goodness, yes, absolutely. And um, it was an important one for me because it empowered me to become who I became eventually as a woman with a disability, as an advocate for disability rights. Um, it shifted my gears uh, from being that shy, quiet girl to being pretty much a powerful spokesperson for other minorities with disabilities. Well, and you, because you, if you remember, if you remember back then, you know, we, we were not as colorful as we are now. No, <laughs> and I'm, I'm kind of like putting it nicely, right? <laughs> you've, you've used your uh, personal attributes to recruit and bring in many people to the movement. Do you feel that's your calling? Mm, in part, yes. I, I think that regardless of race or abilities or disability, I, I think that my calling is, is, is to continue continued advocacy in the disability community in Houston. And I'm so proud of being part of this history, so proud. Art, you, uh, you're the youngster uh, among us here today, I guess. Um, you actually were looking for a job when you found uh, Houston's uh, transit issues, weren't you? I, w I was, Lex. Uh, I, I came, I'm a native Houstonian. I came here 
uh, to, I came to Houston Metro straight out of uh, college, graduating from the University of North Texas, North Texas State back then. And uh, so, yeah, I, I came looking for a job, started off uh, part-time employee making $7.25 an hour, uh, happy to have a job and happy to help out. What were you doing then? I was taking calls. I was on the, uh, the telephone, answering calls, scheduling uh, transportation for folks. And uh, again, as a native Houstonian, uh, I was injured in a football accident in 1984. And who would have ever known that uh, many, many, many years from, from uh, that point that I'd be at this point. Uh, so when I look at the video, I'm truly humble because I'm not only a, a benefactor and a trustee, but now when I look at the next generation, I'm becoming a mentor uh, to the next generation of, of advocates and uh, community service individuals. So. Now, Art, if I remember correctly, the guy who hired you was a man named Jim Laughlin, who was the, uh, Jim actually had the only disability related job in Metro for many years. Th that, that, that's correct, Jim, uh, Jim Laughlin, uh, was just a true pioneer. He was a, a friend, a, a mentor to me, uh, someone who I enjoyed learning from and who unfortunately passed away in 2007. Did he ever tell you the story about how he got involved? Jim told me a lot of stories. <laughs> 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 and you were in some of those stories. <laughs> so Art, uh, Jim was, uh, you know, he was out in those photographs we saw of people in the streets. Jim was one of us in the streets. I think when it, uh, Bob Geyer was testifying before the city council, Jim was sitting right behind him, feeding him notes and so on. Um, we went all together to the Office of Public Transportation after that uh, city council meeting. And we confronted, at that time, the head of the Houston Transit Agency, uh, Barry Goodman, who still lives in the area, I think. Um, we confronted Mr. Goodman and Jim was one of the uh, spokespeople for us saying, look, you, you know, why don't you all accommodate uh, this part of the community? And the next thing we knew, Barry Goodman offered Jim a job. <laughs> Good move. <laughs> so he helped to uh, pull together what Houston did in a transitional way, but uh, the demonstrations were just going nowhere. Do you have uh, data about that? The, the demonstrations uh, as far as the uh, public demonstrations? Well, no, the, what happened is uh, Metro, the Metro's predecessor, Utran, decided that they would take a few accessible buses right. and run them on selected routes. And so with the help of the Brain Trust at Rice University, I mean, excuse me, but they uh, suggested that they run the buses from the medical center to downtown to demonstrate how people with disabilities might or might not use them. Predictably, the outcome was? Correct. D d not, not a lot of ridership. Exactly. There's not too many people checking out a Methodist and moving downtown, right? Correct. The, uh, uh, it, Jim actually had to summarize all that. And uh, Lori, I guess that's about the time that uh, CBFL got involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. We realized, we were looking at that research um, and that data and we decided that we really needed to do something. And um, we decided to pursue a lawsuit. Now, Maria, you were among the Houstonians who went to Washington yes. for the signing of the ADA. Yes, and I always like to say that I'm one of the proud uh, capital crawlers of the pre-ADA march, you know? Explain as that. As you remember. Uh, in March of 1990, right before the ADA was passed, as you remember, uh, we had this huge march of disability advocates from all over the nation. Yeah, the, the, that was necessitated. Exactly. Because despite all the efforts for advocacy and despite the support of the president and many of the members of the Congress, the bill actually stalled. Right. And that was a very critical moment, so you, and others. And others from uh, Houston. I'm so proud of Houston, so proud of CBFL, so proud to be part of this history. So we went to Washington, D.C., and we kicked butt. <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's, I mean, it's one way of describing getting out of your wheelchair and pulling yourself up about 25 steps. Uh, actually, it's more like 75 steps. Wow. Yeah. 
uh, I remember them clearly. So, needless to say. <laughs> and that was the say. front of the Capitol. So yes. So, you, you got a yes. lot of uh, publicity for that. Right. And, you know, I always like to joke and say that the little eight-year-old girl with CP stole the show because I was right next to her. I was like, oh, man, this little girl's going to beat me. And she sure did. <laughs> <laughs> but after that, uh, it awakened the, the rest of the Congress, and we began to move forward. And then you had to turn around and go back right. for the signing ceremony. Right. How did that feel? Amazing. Amazing. Amazing to have been part of, of this it's now history, which we share with, with future generations, what we had to do in order to gain access, just a simple everyday life. And, you know, the work that we continue to do, I mean, that, that, that's what is most amazing to me, that we have worked so hard to be where we are now and to realize that there's still so much work ahead of us. Lori, when you were at the uh, signing ceremony, did you, uh, you tear up over little things. Did, <laughs> did, did, you, did you cry? I was crying. It was such an emotional moment. It was so moving to be there with all these thousands of people who had worked so hard um, t on this passage of the ADA. And what was also so moving is to see so many parents with children there and you could see how the children were going to really benefit from this. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience. Art, when the law passed, were there immediate changes in the city, in the, uh, particularly in Metro where you worked? Without a, without a doubt, Lex, <clears throat> one of the things that we immediately have to do, had to do back then once the law was passed was come up with ADA plans for uh, how Metro was going to implement various services and come into compliance. Uh, with the ADA. So we began to look at the service area that we were going to have to, to serve. Uh, back then, uh, the service was started out a small service with a handful of vehicles from different uh, agencies and organizations that operated just within inside the, the 610 loop. And so we had to expand the services and uh, just come up with plans on purchasing vehicles, uh, eligibility requirements as to who would be able to use the paratransit service, who would be able to uh, utilize the accessible bus service that we now had. Uh, so it's quite significant. One of the things that, that sets Metro apart from other transit agencies is the customers. And that the advocacy, the, uh, the communication that the community has, uh, that, that helps you get better. Uh, and you've always got to have your doors open and uh, hear those ideas and create partnerships. And I think that's one of the things that um, Metro learned through lawsuits and challenges. And uh, you can work one way or you can work a smarter way and be more cooperative. And I think we really learned that lesson and that carries us on today. So Houston today is regarded as one of the most uh, uh, successful examples of implementation of uh, accessible transportation. And I guess part of that relates to the fact that we have two modes. One of them is the over the road uh, buses that are accessible and the other is the door to door service that complements that. Are there challenges we're facing today? We're, we're, we're always facing challenges because Houston is such a dynamic city that's constantly growing. More and more people are coming to the city each and every day. And now we actually have three modes. We have li a light rail system that's fully accessible for people with disabilities. We have uh, park and ride services. We have van pool services, uh, paratransit services. It's just a, a host of services that uh, for people with disabilities. And they're, they're, they're not perfect systems. And we're going to continue to ask the community to be advocates, to be uh, partners with us and give us feedback so that we can continue to improve the services. Just yesterday I was watching a city council meeting and uh, I heard uh, a, a young lady come and talk about some of the challenges she was facing and we immediately had to get on the phone and reach out to this person. So again, agencies, services get better when there's public engagement, customer engagement, so that you can get better. And uh, these folks do it great. We all do it great. Uh, Maria, uh, speaking from the standpoint of the advocacy community in Houston, what would you say are the current major challenges? As far as transportation or just in general? Start with transportation and we we'll go from there. <laughs> How about street accessibility? 
you know, when it relates to transportation, we talk about transportation, yes, all the buses may be accessible, and, and we're so grateful for that. Uh, but at the same time, somebody in a wheelchair still cannot have the freedom to just say, oh, I'm going to hop on the bus and go to point X from point A, whatever, uh, simply because we don't know the condition of the sidewalks or how they are going to be. So we have to pair up street accessibility with accessible transportation. Otherwise, there's no true accessibility. So that's one. And of course, you know, housing, uh, affordable, accessible, integrated housing is something that HCIL, CBFL, um, and all of our three centers continue to advocate for. Uh, we, are, we are the ones who have the contract in the entire region six to be able to relocate people from nursing homes. So, um, Well, and I've heard that's the biggest challenge in is. getting people out of nursing homes is the lack of accessible housing in the community. Exactly. And then the good thing and then the blessing is that HCIL does have housing vouchers. When we relocate somebody from a nursing home into the community, um, we are able to actually provide them with a Section 8 Assuming voucher. they can find a, an accessible space. Exactly. But, you Lori, know, so have, that's, you, have you observed fighting. the same challenges? Yes. Um, housing is a big issue, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I live near uh, Clear Lake City, and we have a huge development that's going in. 700 homes are getting ready to be built. 700 and homes are all going to be accessible? N no. No. Probably, I, I doubt if any of them will be accessible. Um, I mean, there are track builders that are going to be building them, um, and unless you make, you request specific changes, like having a bathroom door that's wider, you know, it's not going to be done. But the problem is, baby boomers or uh, exactly. middle-aged people are going to buy those homes, move right. into them, and 15 years, 20 years, 30 years later, Yes. the home is not going to do them any good. No, it's not. And it would be wonderful if we could have builders that would build homes so that people can age in place. And it takes very little to do that when you're, uh, when, when you're doing new construction. It's very expensive to go back and remodel. Do you find it ironic in a way that uh, this program showed people with disabilities, advocates discussing the very same issue uh, 25 years, no, actually 32 years ago, more like. Yeah, it is. It is ironic. Yeah, I mean, we have a, we've, we've come a long way, but we still have so much more that we need to do. Art, what, uh, as uh, just a person in the community, I know you're involved in many civic activities. You have a, a vital uh, family life. Uh, your kids are in school. Your, your wife is active in, in employment and and uh, civic roles and so on. Does it seem entirely natural for you using a wheelchair to be integrated in the community or do you still run into issues that you say this shouldn't really be a problem? I, I do run into situations. I'll tell you, I was down and uh, my wife and I went to Corpus Christi and we went to a restaurant a few years ago for uh, dinner and uh, the, rest, the restroom wasn't accessible. and. Uh, we talked to the manager and we, we voiced our concerns and we left and a few years later I went to the same rest restaurant and uh, sure enough it still wasn't accessible and so I had to do what any person with the, I had to call an attorney like Lori and uh, we talked about it and it, it was resolved so again there are situations where people are reluctant to change but there are other situations the predominant situations people are willing to change and accommodate so you face challenges uh, I remember in 1984 the first thing one of the first things they teach you a tier is how to jump a curb in your wheelchair well that was because there weren't any a lot of curb cuts or there was challenges that you would face so we face challenges to, to today but uh, again it's much better than it was because of pioneers like the the folks I'm sitting here with. Uh, Lori do you find the same barriers? Yes and it's um, ironic that it's in um, the healthcare industry is where I find a lot. Where? Tell me. Well because I'm aging with a disability so I'm I, having... I, I didn't realize that. Yes, yes I am. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I see a doctor more frequently, I'm getting tests more frequently and it just surprises me how often, how difficult it is to get on an exam table, to have an MRI done, to uh, just be seen, you know, in a normal office by a doctor is sometimes very challenging. So if you go and they want to examine you, 
and the table's up. Uh, it, it just happened to me last week. I have a new doctor and I needed to get on the exam table and the table was like this high. I mean, I couldn't do it. All of them were like that and it was a new facility. Brand new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maria? I can absolutely relate. Totally relate. I mean, healthcare industry, and and you're absolutely right, Lori. It is usually almost always in the newer facilities. Mm -hmm. They're the mm -hmm. ones that need the most education right now, uh, in accessibility. But yeah, we're still definitely facing some of the same challenges as before. Lori, do you think that uh, public officials pay more attention now? They 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 consider us to be part of the community more than before. Do we have their ear now when before we didn't? Or you still find issues that you try to deal with where they don't really get it? Well, I think both. Um, I certainly think that uh, public officials know that um, we're a group to be determined with and that we have rights and that we vocalize those rights. But, um, I mean, I remember back, you know, 30 years ago just having to depend on the kindness of strangers, you know, to get anywhere. In, you know, a clothing store, a beauty shop, or whatever. Um, but I don't face those issues as much anymore. But I think, and also I think as people, as we're aging, and baby boomers are facing so many other um, problems and similar kinds of disabilities that public officials are more sensitive to it. Maria, you agree? I just wanted to say, yes, and I just wanted to say something when I, uh, what, backing up um, on what Lori said about aging with a disability, is that the one thing that we have to realize as a community is that the disability community is the one minority that eventually everyone will join through the aging process. So when we are asking for accessibility, it's not just for us. If it works for us, it'll work for everybody. That's the big duh. You know, I mean, that's the way I look at it. If it works for us, trust me, it'll work for strollers and bikes and uh, roller skates, anything on wheels, you know? So we're not asking for anything special. Disability rights are not special rights. So this is, we're, we're chanting the same message 30 years later. I hear, uh, you know, so, oh, uh, sorry. I, get I a hear a lot bit. of people supporting that uh, viewpoint. Uh, Art, you, uh, in the community, you, um, you're very active. Um, you're also a sports aficionado. Who would have thought a guy who uh, broke his uh, neck in a football game would even care about sports anymore? What about all the venues, all the uh, activities we have in our community? Are they all accessible? We're, we're doing much better. We're doing much better at the, uh, the venues. Uh, we, I, th I think that uh, the venues are having advisory groups, which is really important, listening to the customers. Uh, again, it's... It, it could be, many people have to understand that it may just be you wanting to go somewhere with your father who's in a, in a wheelchair or something. It, it demonstrates it's a customer service feature, number one, uh, that businesses have to recognize it. And, and that's where it really starts sometimes with the dollars that be, if you're accessible, if you're accommodating, um, then we'll, we'll spend our dollars with you. If you're not, we're not going to spend our dollars with you. And I think that that often uh, gets the, uh, the attention of businesses, whether they be sports authorities or uh, groups like that. So again, things are, are getting better. There's always room for uh, improvement. I, don't re I know you're a baseball fan and we go to the stadium sometimes together. We, Houston's blessed to have uh, beautiful uh, venues and, and uh, most often winning teams. Uh, the uh, uh, Astros were in the World Series uh, a few years ago. Some of us can still remember. And <laughs> there goes the pool house ball right there. <laughs> the, <laughs> you remember that? The, the, uh, exactly. The, uh, I remember getting tickets to one of those games and uh, going to the stadium to the seating that was supposed to be, it was made uh, for people with disabilities and they had cameras setting up there. Right. And then uh, the ushers said, well, the, you know, they've taken these seats away. Their priority is the cameras. And I, I didn't feel good about that. And I said, where can I sit? And the usher took me to another area and there were folding chairs filled with patrons, none of whom had physical impairments. Right. Is that an attitudinal thing? Because obviously the facility could accommodate it, it, it's an attitudinal, it's a poor service, it's, it's all of the above. And I think that, again, having an opportunity to bring those type of uh, 
concerns to individuals' attention uh, within the uh, different organizations, whether they be the Rockets or the Astros, letting them know about the challenges that, uh, that we face. Uh, many of the organizations have customer service or, or ADA uh, uh, groups within the company that you can speak with and they're they're for the most part very accommodating and will work with individuals so I'm pleased about that and things are getting better but we still have a ways to go. Lori you uh, you drive I know uh, got a great uh, record with those new cars uh, <laughs> you uh, always looking for parking spaces yes do you find them harder to get now than they used to be? Do you know? Yes, and it's amazing because when I go to the grocery store, I, I, I end up driving around um, a lot trying to wait for an accessible spot. So what's the problem? Um, well, I don't, I don't know. I think, um, well, they don't have enough uh, accessible parking places. But I also think that people don't realize that I need a space um, for my, to be able to get out of my car. It's not that I'm closer to the entrance of the grocery store. That's not as important. It's being able to open my car door all the way and get my wheelchair in and out. So you find people using those spaces who could just as well, they, maybe they have the hang tag. That's another issue I yes. have. Maria, do you, have you all looked at the question of how these hang tags are issued? Do, do physicians just pass them out? Sometimes I wonder. Um, you know what, I have kind of wonder about that too, and, and, and going back to your point and your question to Lori, I, I do think, and if you see that there are some blue ones and some red ones, the red one represents a temporary disability, right? And the blue one represents a permanent disability, but also we're competing with pregnant women who get parking spaces now, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, but probably so. I mean, there is always room for abusing the power. Uh, of, of something, you know. I mean, I'm, I don't want to be judgmental and say, yeah, we have a whole bunch of fake disabled people out there, but it's something to think about when people with real disabilities cannot find parking spaces. And it brings me to thinking of airports where people request a wheelchair to, so they can board first kind of thing. And I know I'm getting off topic, mm -hmm. but yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Art, uh, you, uh, of course, you don't have any problems parking. You just call up Metro and they'll take you wherever <laughs> you need. <laughs> Not fair. Is that like <laughs> myth number one? <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, it was interesting, Lex. One, I, I do uh, ride Metro and I ride the paratransit system, Metro Lift. And one day I was, I ride under different names so I can test the service and just see how things are going. So one day I parked and a cab driver came to pick me up. And the cab driver said, I, no, I don't pick up people in wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. nice. And I was, okay. And so I said, well, I can transfer, you know, into the vehicle. Will you help me? And he said, no, I don't trans transfer. So this is a, a, a yeah, this is a Metro, Metro cabs. And so I said, <laughs> so I, so I said, I said, okay. And the guy rolled up his window and drove off. Point being is, is that we made thousands of pickups that day. I just happened to, to have a driver that didn't do what he was supposed to do. The driver received corrective action and, um, Th things happen like that from time to time, but day in and day out, things go, go really well in the services that Metro provides, but uh, having that open door, having that open line of communication really helps out. Uh, Lori, the, uh, uh, we're about to end the, the, the panel, but I wanted to know what kind of advice you would give to younger people with disabilities, people who didn't have the opportunity to experience this uh, activism and this uh, coming out and this uh, new awakening that we all experienced through the 70s and 80s. Well, I remember at one point uh, about 10 years ago, a bunch of us were sitting around as old advocates saying that maybe we should put curb cuts back in and maybe we should put more barriers back in so <laughs> that people would really understand, you know, what we went through to gain this access. Um, perseverance. Um, is really very, very important. Know to, knowing who to contact if you have an issue, um, how to articulate that issue, how to put that issue in writing, um, follow up, those are all really good, I think, good things Maria, to do. would you add anything to that? Yeah, um, I would just like to say for young, to young people with disabilities, to recognize that people before them lay the foundation for the independence that they are able to have now and to not forget that the movement is still awake and out there and in need of, of 
younger blood and advocates. So one of the things that we are doing is reaching out to youth with disabilities to want to empower them and kind of pass that torch of activism. Now, the people, youth with disabilities or anybody with a disability in Houston who wants to talk advocacy or needs assistance can contact the Houston Center for Independent Absolutely. Living. Absolutely. What's the, how do they, what's the protocol? What number do they call? 713-974-4621. And they can also find us on the internet, uh, Houston CIL, Facebook, Houston CIL, and we also have a, a website, uh, hcil.com. Um, okay. Art, I'm sure, sure I messed it up, but. <laughs> you have, uh, you're teaching your kids every day. What do you teach them about uh, disability rights? Lex, I have, my, my daughter's off at college, and I taught her the same thing I'm teaching my 14-year-old now, Lex, is, and this is just my philosophy in life, to whom much is given, much is required. And no matter what your circumstance or your situation is, you can still contribute. And I'm teaching them to be active in community service. Uh, I, I ran for an office out in, in, in my neighborhood, and I didn't make it. But my son was there knocking on doors with me, and the next semester he went and ran for city council at his school, and he won. And he oh, said, Dad, that's how you do it. All right. <laughs> all right, well, I want to thank all of you. Uh, uh, Lori, uh, thank you so much for everything you've done. And uh, Maria, thank you for being here today. Thank you for what you continue to do. Art, uh, I'm going to dial Metro and see if I can catch a cab. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank uh, all of you. Thank you so much. There's no doubt that Houston has played a seminal role in the fight for disability rights. Houstonian George Bush will long be remembered as the president who advocated for and worked for the ADA. And of course, he'll be rec remembered as the president who signed the act into law on July 26, 1990. Many other Houstonians have played important roles in helping to improve opportunities and quality of life for people with disabilities in Houston and throughout the world. We're all very grateful to them for what they have done. Houston may long be remembered for its role in the fight for disability rights in the late 20th century. Let's all work together so that our city is also remembered as one that created new opportunities for individual productivity and full participation in the 21st century. Once again, thank you to our panel and to our studio audience, and thanks to the awesome producers and staff at HTV for putting this exceptional production together. Finally, I want to thank our sponsors, Real Abilities Houston, the JFS Alexander Institute for Inclusion, Tier Memorial Herman, and the Southwest ADA Center. If you have questions or require technical assistance about the Americans with Disabilities Act, telephone the Southwest ADA Center at 1-800-949-4232. I'm Lex Frieden. Thank you for joining us for this special program and celebrate ADA 25.